Hello, and welcome to the third asynchronous virtual roundtable on reopening cities. I'm Hani Mahmasani, director of the Northwest University Transportation Center, and I'll be your moderator. An asynchronous virtual roundtable is one where the interviews uh, have already taken place and have been integrated into a single uh, roundtable. Uh, following uh, the interviews, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, please use the Q&A feature uh, of Zoom. Our series on reopening cities is motivated by the fact that cities lie at the core of social, cultural, and economic activity and are an embodiment of human civilization. As cities reopen to varying degrees with COVID-19 still a major concern, we seek to understand and highlight the challenges that are faced by various forms of mobility in cities and share best practices among companies and agencies in the mobility space. In the past two asynchronous virtual roundtables, we focused on the vital role um, that public transportation plays in reopening our cities. Today, we address the last mile delivery aspect and connection with e-delivery and e-commerce, which have come to play an essential role in keeping households and businesses supplied with essential goods during the crisis. To discuss these challenges, we have three distinguished panelists from critical segments of the e-delivery spectrum. First, uh, we have Susan Sweat, who is VP for Operations Planning and Engineering at FedEx Express, a household name that all of us are familiar with. Uh, Vignesh Ganapathy serves as Head of Government Relations with Postmates, an on-demand logistics and delivery company. Um, then we'll have uh, Mike Brennan, who is Senior Advisor at Farmer's Fridge and past Chief Operating Officer at Peapot. And with this, uh, we will start with our first interview. So, um, Susan, you're a VP for uh, Operations Planning and Engineering uh, at the FedEx Express World Headquarters in Memphis, uh, where you've been responsible for the planning of domestic pickup and delivery uh, and hub operations since June 2015. Uh, but you've been with the company for, you know, several years. You've held uh, VP roles and customer experience and compliance, as well as operations. So you kind of know both the, the customer side and the, uh, uh, the, the operational side. And you're a five-time recipient of the FedEx Five Star Award, the company's highest employee achievement award. So uh, we're delighted to have you uh, with us today. Uh, and uh, as you know, we're we're interested in um, kind of examining the the whole sort of pickup delivery process, the whole e-delivery phenomenon as cities are beginning to reopen. And it's been more than four months now since the initial shelter-in-place lockdown orders were put in place. Uh, life has not quite been the same in, in, you know, in most parts of the country and the world, in fact. And um, one of the aspects, of course, is there's been a surge in e-commerce uh, and e-delivery, uh, initially specialized needs, uh, you know, uh, essential goods, but then pretty much everything, nearly anything that you couldn't get in a store anymore, you, you were ordering online. And, uh, you know, we've had that trend, it was a systemic trend already before COVID, really towards greater reliance on e-commerce. And FedEx has, of course, been at the leading edge of that trend for at least the past two decades, if not longer. Still, you know, how did FedEx handle that surge in demand? At a time when capacity may have been hampered by health-related concerns and measures, and what would you say were the most challenging operational aspects during that period, again, during sort of the the, the, the peak of the uh, of sort of the lockdown shelter in, in, in place. Um, has it been too much demand in some markets where you may not have had capacity uh, because of health concerns with drivers, for instance, issues at sorting facilities, at nodes, um, finding capacity to move the packages, either long haul or local distribution last mile? Has it been that customers have been unreasonable? You know, when under in this environment, they still want everything, you know, um, the same day or next day or whatever. Or has it been shippers being unreliable or all of the above? Well, that's a very uh, big question, a lot to unpack. So let me start with basically how this all started. In about March, you know, we all started having these uh, shelter at home orders. And the biggest thing we faced initially was starting to warehouse freight. So if you think about it, you know, we'll move millions of packages through our system every night. 
And we started finding places, um, New York was a prime example, where we were just having to store freight in our facilities because businesses were closed and shippers didn't want it back and recipients weren't there to receive. So we started seeing a lot of warehousing issues going on. I mean, we were running out of space. We were renting pods to put freight in. We were staging tractor trailers to put freight in because there was nobody to receive. So that was the first indication that we were gonna be experiencing some normalcy issues and for the short term at least and actually it's extended a little bit longer than we thought it would at this point but it has uh, started to flatten out a little bit mm -hmm. and we have faced the same thing that many organizations have faced no matter how many safety precautions you put into place in the workplace you do have employees that are that are going to be affected by the virus and it has uh, affected our ability to uh, staff every position that we normally have. Mm -hmm. But luckily our, our network is flexible mm -hmm. and we can change routings if we need to. Uh, we saw that up in Newark, for example. Uh, you know, that area extremely hard hit. So we were able to divert aircraft to other sort facilities where we weren't seeing such an increase in uh, virus illnesses and uh, so we were able to still continue to sort and meet the delivery needs by reorganizing where our freight was going based on what the situation was there. So we have a very nimble and flexible system which has worked for us and just the comment about the customers Yes, this is a time where anxiety is high. Uh, people, whether they're waiting for masks at home or they're waiting for that business document because they've been working from home and they have to have it to complete whatever they're doing. It has been a challenge, but I will say that overall our customers have been very understanding of any delay or miscommunication on the delivery because I think in their normal lives, they're facing very similar crisis. So uh, they've been great about it, but our goal is to always service them as they expect to be serviced. So we've reorganized our system to, to try and do that. And, and you know, we've been able to move drivers around uh, in many of the major cities like Chicago, for example, mm -hmm. we have several, several uh, facilities there, 12, at least, I used to live in Chicago, we have at least 12 facilities there. So if we show, had one facility where they were experiencing a large uh, issue, then we could move employees there from other locations on a short-term basis. And also as our business volume declined, it was just really replaced with the residential increase. Exactly, exactly. So with that kind of initial demand surge subsiding, you know, after the first I guess a couple of months. Um, uh, it's difficult to ascertain exactly where we might be in terms of demand and so on, just because there's still so much uh, uncertainty around us. But have you seen sort of a return more to kind of pre-COVID levels in terms of e-commerce um, and perhaps uh, seen a shift in terms of the kinds of goods that are moving, you know, less health related, back to more discretionary types of goods. And you also mentioned that, and that's a very interesting take on it, is that, uh, you know, with a lot of the work at home, you know, the documents that were going to offices were probably now going to the home side. And that's not something that we've, uh, the, 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 you know, that we've been as aware of, I guess, as the, uh, the, the e-commerce uh, side of things. Could you comment a little bit about that? Well, I've got to be honest, we are not seeing a decline in the residential requirements. Now, uh, our mix, business to residential, has changed significantly. Mm -hmm. And like you said, we can't predict the future, but uh, directionally, it seems that we're not going to see a change in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look around, a lot of major corporations are going to have people continuing to work from home, mm -hmm. and they're not bringing them back to the office in the near term or even the midterm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue to see a very high percentage of our traffic, our daily traffic at the residential stage. Mm -hmm. And 
business to business has picked up and it will grow unless we get into another situation where we're in major uh, lockdowns or shelter at homes. But business to business is coming back. If you look at what's coming inbound from Asia, I mean, the industry is starting to pick up again. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to grow, but we do not see any expected decline in the near term in residential delivery. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, again, as we look at the reopening of cities, you know, at an urban level, is that bringing with it additional or different kinds of customer demands in terms of e-commerce and delivery services. And I'm thinking, for instance, um, um, you know, you look at small businesses, for instance, that had been closed and now they're having to resupply uh, or a restaurant that might be opening up and they need all kind of cleaning, PPE, et cetera. Are you picking any of that up as part of the reopening move? Uh, we are, we are. I mean, inventory uh, has, been low or non-existent in some places. And yes, we are trying to fulfill all of those demands and, and requirements because these businesses want to be back up and functioning as fully as they possibly can. So they're relying on us to ensure that they're able to do that. So yes. So um, FedEx is known for innovative practices in terms of real-time tracking and giving customers visibility into where their shipments might be along the way. Uh, whenever I have a shipment coming, you know, my phone rings very early in the morning and, this, uh, and I get the alert. Uh, so could you comment about, you know, uh, FedEx Express's practices in this regard and the value specifically for e-commerce and any new innovations that may have been motivated by lessons learned uh, during the crisis, again, in terms of tracking, visibility, uh, ability to, to know where, where things are in the process. Right. Well, everybody wants to know where their package is at any given moment. And, and strangely enough, you don't have to be home to get the package. In most cases, you know, we leave it as, as most of the carriers do, but people still want to know. Even here, sitting at my desk, I had a package delivered today and I got the notice. I was like, oh good, my package is there on my front porch. So that's just human nature now. That's honestly, that's the expectation. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, it was not. Being able to just track a package was a bonus, but now it's an expectation. And our customers want the most real-time information that they can possibly get. And for our business customers, especially whether that be healthcare or um, you know, just, energy, different business sectors that are really interested in what we're able to do with them and their supply chain. And, you know, you probably know that we've entered recently into a partnership with, uh, like with Microsoft. We mm -hmm. like to think that we've joined the best in logistics with the best in technology. And uh, the first joint project that we're doing with Microsoft is Surround, and it's related to our business customers. And Really, it will be uh, an effort to help them become even more real-time uh, knowledgeable in their uh, inventory supply and uh, take some AI learnings from that and give them even better information. So we're excited about that from the business perspective, but from the e-commerce, everybody wants to know where their package is. And honestly, I don't think that we'll see anything significantly different in the short term for our customers. We're already providing a high degree of information to them, right. but um, technology evolves as things happen. And this pandemic is a classic example of things that we wouldn't have imagined six months ago that are needed, that mm -hmm. are expected and needed now by the customer. So we will continue to evolve into their expectations and, and what they need to feel comfortable with the shipment. Mm -hmm. So again, looking now to sort of the, the, the medium term and, and actually more to the, the longer term uh, and looking at the demand side, uh, you know, the transportation planning community, there's a lot of interest, obviously, and speculation as well for all kinds of services from, you know, in, in, on the mobility uh, end of things uh, in terms of, you know, whether these tele activities uh, that have been adopted on the large scale during the crisis will, will persist. So you, we, we talked a little bit about telework and you know, when people will, will go back, but e-commerce in particular had been really strong and increasing and many retailers had been going to omni-channel, et cetera, long before we had the crisis. And the question is anybody who had not even, you know, who had not 
purchase online before clearly now has done so and they've relied on delivery services and so on. And the question is how much of that is really going to continue post-crisis, uh, whenever that might be. Um, and do you foresee a lasting shift to e-commerce purchases from consumers, or will they revert back to their pre-crisis buying patterns, which are, again, sort of a combination, I guess, of online versus in-store? And, uh, you know, what's the stickiness, I guess, of that, of that increased demand? Uh, you know, how much of it might be retained over time, and I'm thinking again, longer term, not in the next few months, because we know in the next few months, there's still a lot of uncertainty that's floating around. An opinion only. So it's yeah, of course. knowing so that everything it's all speculative is, right yes, now. Yes, speculative. Good word. Um, I believe that we're going to continue to see the same type of growth. Because if you think about who our e commerce customer base was previously, mm -hmm. it was a younger, um, more Gen X group. Yeah, uh, yeah. They were they started it. They they love it. They're on their phone constantly. It's easy access. But the crisis has generated something that probably would not have organically grown, and that is we've expanded the age group. Um, mm -hmm. The you know my mom, for example, not a, usually a big uh, e-commerce shipper. But wow, she loves it now. It's great. It, it comes when she wants it. She just sits down on the iPad at night. So I think that we've tapped into a couple of generations that we may not have been in with before just out of necessity. Now they see how easy it is. Now they see how convenient it is. I think they're going to be doing that more and more um, just because they're, they've been introduced to it. And they knew it was out there before, but there wasn't a need. They mm -hmm. didn't have to. They had to, and now they like it. So I think we're going to continue to see that population that we weren't perhaps touching as strongly in the past involved continuously in this. So okay. I don't foresee, speculating of course, yes, a yeah. significant drop in e-commerce shipping. Yeah, and I, I, agree, I agree with you totally, uh, absolutely. Uh, so going back more to the now, looking at sort of the last mile aspect of it, the, you know, the urban delivery, et cetera, there's a lot of discussion in planning circles about rethinking and reinventing cities. You know, London, for example, wants to give streets back to people, uh, you know, refocusing them on people with some streets converted to pedestrian and bicycle traffic only. So like Market Street in San Francisco is an example, uh, several places in London, Paris, and now in Chicago, uh, various streets have been partially closed or reduced in width to allow for outdoor dining. Uh, of course, you can only do that in the summer in Chicago. You know, we're not gonna <laughs> keep that, right? But but anyway, so so they've converted a number of streets for these other uses. Is that a consideration at all for FedEx at this stage in terms of the kinds of delivery vehicles or even distribution network design to consider possibly smaller electric-powered vehicles, maybe using drones and robots to address what certainly uh, some customer demographic might consider more desirable and what might be more compatible with this vision of reinventing cities? Right. Well, there's several initiatives going on that happened before the pandemic. I mean, we made our first drone flight in October of 2019 in Christiansburg, Virginia, and, and we continue that, that uh, service uh, to those residents and are collecting additional data to, to find ways to expand that and working with the FAA to do that. Um, we also have Roxo, our robot, who can do same-day deliveries and is being piloted in several cities and um, wouldn't be anything to see her in Chicago. And I refer to her as her, but maybe yeah. she's just Roxo, uh -huh. and doing uh, same-day deliveries in downtown Chicago. So uh, we've, you know, we have robots, uh, we have drones, we, we're using those, and, and definitely they will continue to grow as part of our program in the future. Um, as far as vehicles go, quite frankly, having pedestrian uh, areas, it's great for us. We park once and then we, we span mm -hmm. a greater area. Much better than having to move the truck. I can't tell you how many times we're booted in Chicago. <laughs> Love it, but uh, we don't have to move the truck 10 times. You know, we basically just set up shop and then operate out of the truck, not having to move. So, um, 
we have recently in the last uh, three to four years scaled down the size of our vehicles um, mm -hmm. because of package footprint, et cetera. But uh, in general, the, the, the fleet that we have right now works both in the, the normal and then this new uh, issue that we might see with the, the pedestrians and uh, the drones and, and uh, Roxo, our robot, will continue to, to grow too because there's definitely in the future a uh, audience for that, places where that will be immeasurably uh, successful. Is, islands is there, and stuff like that. Is there a target, uh, I guess, in terms of time frame for when we might see more deployment of either drones and or robots? Well, we're working with the FAA, of course, that's yeah. a, a large part of it. And actually, besides the deliveries that we're doing in Christiansburg, we're working here at the Memphis airport uh, with the FAA to do some AI learnings, et cetera, with some drops and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. I think technology will move as fast as uh, the regulations allow us to. Okay. Uh, would you say that the crisis has slowed or delayed introduction of new technologies and service concepts, or would you say that it has, in fact, accelerated innovation? Well, necessity is the mother of innovation. I think that's the phrase, and it couldn't be more true in, in this situation. And I don't just see it in logistics. I see it in many different uh, areas uh, mm -hmm. out in the, the the world. I believe that w the pandemic has shown that there are some gaps that we would like to fill. Uh, I don't know that the full uh, work has been done or is being able to be done right now on those identified areas, mm -hmm. but certainly uh, the the ideas are flowing. Mm -hmm. and being outlined. And as soon as we get to some normalcy, I think that there'll be full steam ahead. Excellent. Um, Susan, it's been very informative. Thank you very much. Do you have any final thoughts for us? I would just say that um, stay well, stay healthy, and I look forward to a time when we can uh, be in person to uh, share all of the knowledge that uh, your group has. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, Vignesh, uh, you serve as head of government relations with Postmates, uh, an on-demand logistics and delivery company, focus on the future of work, privacy, robotics, mobility, and how uh, tech intersects with our communities. Uh, Vignesh, you're also uh, an Ash Center uh, fellow for democracy and technology at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, you serve on the board of um, Loudlight, uh, an organization driving youth progressive action in Kansas through voter engagement and outreach, and uh, Countess Inn, a nonprofit dedicated to uh, voter engagement in Indiana. Uh, through 2018, uh, you headed policy and the racial justice project for the American Civil Liber Liberties Union, the ACLU of Kansas, building a community-focused civil rights agenda in the Midwest. So in addition, of course, to the, you know, the work that you do directly for Postmates, you're, you're um, very much engaged in community service, and we're delighted to be talking to you today. Uh, first, I have a couple of questions to better understand your company, really for our audience to better understand your company. How do you best define what Postmates does? Are you an e-commerce company, a food grocery delivery company, a restaurant takeout delivery company? How would you define the company? the business? So I would say that it's a little bit of all of the above, but I think beyond that, when the company was started back in 2011, the goal was to give brick and mortar retailers the tools they need to succeed in the 21st century. That's a lot of buzzwords, but what that really means is in an era of increasing e-commerce, we see people purchasing from Amazon, from Alibaba, from Wayfair and other, other websites. Um, we really sought to take that business model and invert it. Mm -hmm. Why should you purchase for, from some warehouse that's located outside of your city instead of actually purchasing from local brick and mortar retailers, small businesses, mom and pop shops to be able to receive those very same goods. So we index the inventory of all of those brick and mortar retailers within a city so that mm -hmm. you can pop open the app and you can purchase everything from 
a burrito, which is, you know, I, I, th I think one of the items that people tend to um, want on demand, but you could even get, you know, a hammer and screwdrivers. You could purchase, I've, I've purchased tablecloths on the Postmates app as well. So it can really run the gamut. But um, for us, we see our cities themselves as the warehouses and brick and mortar retailers as, um, you know, uh, needing to level the playing field with some of these e-commerce giants. So it's very relevant really to our theme of reopening cities and reopening our, our economies at this point, I think. Uh, particularly at a local level, uh, that's uh, very interesting. So do you typically deliver point to point or form multi-point tours? And what modes do your delivery postmates, as, as I believe your delivery uh, uh, agents are called, mostly rely on? Do they rely on their own vehicle, uh, in automobile, motorcycle, bicycle, walking, or all of the above? Yeah, so all of our deliveries are point to point, but many of them can be what we call batched or chained. So that's a bulk delivery. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that we use those bulk delivery uh, systems is that it can be much more efficient. Um, we're able to um, deliver multiple goods on the same route and, um, you know, ensure that especially in our um, larger, denser cities that, um, you know, a courier, a Postmate, does not have to park numerous times over the course of a single delivery. Now, when it comes to our modality split, Postmates as a company is modality agnostic. Mm -hmm. I think we're always looking for ways that we can try and minimize car traffic on our roads and think about ways that we can meet the goals of Vision Zero, for example, or carbon neutrality. Um, but that takes significant work, I think, in, in partnership with cities, uh, local governments, and with other agencies to be able to make that happen. So generally, our fleet really resembles the mode split within the cities that we operate in. In New York, for example, 80% of our fleet ride bicycles. It's actually upwards of close to 90% currently. Mm -hmm. And just you know, 20, 10 to 20% of, of our fleet are, are driving traditional cars. Mm -hmm. In LA, it's actually the inverse. So 80% of our fleet are driving cars and 20% of them are riding bicycles. The reason for that, of course, has to do with the vehicles that people tend to use within those locations, as well as what the public infrastructure actually looks like. Exactly. So um, I think that's what our mode split looks like, where we tend to um, you know, incentivize people to use, uh, to do deliveries with the vehicle that makes the most sense. We're not going to send someone on a bicycle to do a 10 mile delivery. And similarly, if there's going to be a two block delivery, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have someone in a car do it. Mm -hmm. So um, during the lockdown, um, there was obviously a surge in e-commerce uh, and home delivery of all sorts of products, you know, initially special needs, PPEs, health related, to essential home goods, cleaning products, et cetera, but then also regular items that one could no longer get in stores because stores were closed. Um, what was the approximate magnitude of that surge and uh, how did it affect your ability to serve your merchant accounts uh, and support demand? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Our, we, among all of the platforms that operate in this space, the one thing that makes Postmates unique is that we deliver from all types of businesses, grocery stores, restaurants, bodegas, um, corner hardware stores, and, and, and so on. We even deliver for Apple, for example, if your iPhone breaks down, you can visit the Apple website and request a Postmate do the delivery to your home. The, what we saw in the wake of the pandemic is that consumer purchasing decisions started to shift slightly. In the very beginning of, of, of the crisis, individuals were, were tended away from traditional brick and mortar restaurants and moved much more toward grocery stores mm -hmm. and those corner bodegas because they were looking to prepare foods themselves at home. Um, the same is true for individuals trying to purchase PPE, masks, um, you know, other other uh, thermometers, for example, where they could purchase from a Walgreens locally on the Postmates platform and be able to receive that uh, that very same day. So we definitely saw upticks in, in, in those corners of our business. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the last couple of months, that's really tended to level out. I think as individuals have started to feel safer and, and slightly more comfortable with the with the current state of affairs, I think um, we've really seen an uptick in individuals 
you know, tending back toward frequenting those local restaurants, especially since we're seeing that local restaurants are really suffering at this time. Exactly. So people really want to be able to invest their money locally. Mm -hmm. So again, staying within more of that lockdown period before sort of the, the reopening or relaxation, um, I believe from, I think your, your website, uh, it says that you have more than 500,000 fleet members called Postmates and uh, about 600,000 merchant accounts in the US. Uh, how did Postmates experience and deal with health-related challenges during this initial surge? Uh, what were the most challenging, perhaps, operational aspects during that period? Has it been merchants shutting down, uh, drivers reluctant to do certain routes because of neighborhoods, areas that may have had more, more, I mean, I'm thinking in areas in New York, for example, where you had certain areas that kind of were uh, redlined there, um, um, or demand, just the whole big surge in demand, you know, dramatically exceeding capacity. Um, is it possibly unreasonable customers uh, who want things immediately when uh, you're just trying to, to meet so much demand or, or other issues? Can you comment on that? Yeah, I think overall, you know, we, we saw that a, a, there's been a, a real, there was a lot of anxiety among the three different corners of our business. So that includes the restaurants, our fleet, mm -hmm. and the customers that are ordering on the platform. The first step that we took was to enable contactless delivery. We were the first of the platforms to do that so that um, an individual who was doing the delivery would not necessarily meet face-to-face -face with the individual who was receiving the delivery. Mm -hmm. Over time, we realized that there were a number of other needs that started popping up. Everything from ensuring that workers on the platform receive two weeks of paid sick leave if they are if, if they are suspected of being COVID positive or if they have to caretake for an individual in their family or a loved one who may be COVID positive as well. We also rolled out a partnership with, um, with Starship HSA and that enabled our Postmates fleet to be able to access HSA funds that they could then go and use to purchase PPE, to go and you know be tested, to visit a doctor all of those individual pieces. And I think in the immediate aftermath of uh, the shelter in place orders going into effect, platforms like ours, various companies and state and local governments were all competing in the open market to be able to procure PPE. So the pricing of this very limited supply started climbing really, really rapidly. Mm -hmm. And it took a, there, there, was a, there was a moment where I think we realized that we, that we needed to coordinate a little bit better. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that we're not acting as an impediment to a hospital trying to procure the exact same equipment. Um, so since then, I think we've really been able to streamline that. And uh, we currently offer PPE and masks and protective equipment to all of our Postmates fleet that, uh, that request it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's all clearly available in the Postmates fleet app. Um, and additionally, I mentioned the two weeks of, of paid sick leave. I mentioned the fleet relief fund. But we also found that there's there were some uh, there was a lot of uh, panic among restaurants that are operating on the platform and are really suffering at this time. So we also put together a restaurant relief package, and the way that is that's oriented is toward ensuring that we're able to continue to drive demand to those restaurants. Mm -hmm. So offering discounts to customers in order to be able to do so, do so, offering discounted marketing expenses so that the restaurant doesn't necessarily need to pay to be able to have, to be bumped up in the app or to have um, a specific carousel card. So when you're scanning through the app, you see that restaurant in, in a more uh, direct fashion. Yeah. Um, and that really provided a lot of background, I think even into the last several weeks, as we've seen, the Black Lives Matter movement and the civil rights, the reignition of the modern civil rights movement take place, mm -hmm. in which um, we decided that we were going to highlight black owned restaurants within all of our markets or our larger markets and, you know, ensure that the rest those black owned restaurants are also having the commissions that they pay us to be on the platform waived uh, for the duration of, 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 of these, this activity, because mm -hmm. we really wanted to show our local customers that you know, these restaurants um, ought to be frequented and and awesome. uh, are able to thrive at this time. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so looking at the latter, again, latter part of the crisis, more like the current situation, June, July, um, are you still operating at much higher levels than, say, pre-COVID crisis or, and, um, 
has it, you know, you alluded to, alluded to that earlier, sort of the demand between the grocery store, you know, store type deliveries versus the restaurant. And you mentioned that you've been trying to direct a little more traffic to the restaurant deliveries, but um, how, uh, is that indeed the case now that you are getting more restaurant delivery type of work uh, 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 demand than grocery deliveries? Uh, or is it still, again, evolving? So it's it's definitely evolving. The you know we notice that the crisis takes a different turn at each each point. Um, I think about several weeks ago when there were ongoing protests throughout our cities and there were areas that were very difficult for um, Postmates fleet members to be to be working in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and there are individuals that we would did not want to put at, at risk of harm, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that mean for us? Do we should we? shut down operations in certain areas? Should we make sure that we are flagging it for our fleet that this is a significant risk? Um, all of those were questions that we started to take into account. Um, as we look at the current state of affairs, we've definitely seen a significant uptick in the number of individuals who are seeking work on the platform. So as, un as the federal unemployment mm -hmm. rate approached 15%. Mm -hmm. um, on our platform, we've seen a nearly 84% uptick in individuals looking for earning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think this really gets down to the key of why individuals seek to work on platforms like this. When mm -hmm. I was growing up, and if I was $200 short on rent in any given month, there were very few earning opportunities for me that would would not be available aside from me scouring Craigslist classifieds or finding seasonal work mm -hmm. during the holidays at a, at a retail establishment. Whereas now you can hop on a platform, do a couple of jobs in order to be able to make that $200 and then decide you never want to work on the platform again. Mm -hmm. Similarly, through this crisis for individuals who um, may have been furloughed or lost their jobs and for whom the current um, federal allotment for unemployment was insufficient or mm -hmm. that they were unable to uh, procure any sort of paycheck protection through their employer, um, that they've been looking for ways to be able to earn that additional income. So mm -hmm. that 84% uptick in, in our Postmates fleet are really, really reflective of the fact that they're individuals who are looking for ways to be able to earn that additional income, especially as we see eviction moratoria, for example, lapsing over the course of the last month or so. And, and, and the coming months as well, that there's going to be an increased need for, for, those, um, for those types of services. So for us, we, we've really seen that shift on, on, on the worker side of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to uh, the restaurants and, and businesses on the platform as well, that you know, they, are, they continue to look for ways to be able to receive that sort of help, especially as SBA loans, for example, have also run dry. We've had uh, increased numbers of restaurants reaching out to us saying, hey, are there ways for us to be able to boost sales at this time? So are you still experiencing any fulfillment challenges with the grocery partners? And I'm asking because at one point during shelter in place, you order something and almost every item is going to come as different because, you know, they didn't have the specific item that you had ordered and there's been substitution, et cetera. Um, are they, and I suspect there may be variation across the country uh, at this point, but are they still experiencing any supply shortages? And are those similar across the country or do you see much variation across various markets where Postmates operates? Yeah, I would say the largest variance tends to be between markets that have reopened and those which have not, um, because in the areas that have reopened, there tends to be a lot more foot traffic. Folks aren't relying on the platform as much to be able to uh, access those needs, whereas in areas that tend to be, still be shut down, being deemed an essential business, in, in individuals are frequently relying on platforms like ours to be able to receive those goods. There haven't necessarily been as many shortages, I think mainly because many of the logistics and supply chain challenges have really been overcome over the last mm -hmm. yeah. couple of months. Um, earlier, I was mentioning the difficulty in procuring PPE. Right now, PPE is much more readily available, though we will see how things will progress, especially uh, since you know, shelter in place orders are being rescinded in a couple of locations, places are opening up. Um, there may be, uh, there may be PPE shortages again in the future. So we're just trying to make sure that we're planning for that and as prepared as possible. So looking ahead again in the near medium term, basically, um, 
now that restaurants are reopening for outdoor and more recently limited capacity indoor dining in some locations, have you found that the restaurant delivery side of the business uh, is dropping a bit? Or is there a synergistic effect where there's actually even more delivery requests because more restaurants are reopening? And I'm, I'm really wondering about that question. Yeah, I think it's, it's much more on the synergistic side. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what we tend to find is um, people use delivery as a bit of a, a lead generator. And I, I mentioned this not in the traditional sense, but that this is lead generation for an individual who is visiting a restaurant using the app eventually goes into that restaurant. So as these restaurants are opening up, um, the initial customer interaction may be one that they have on the Postmates app, but as they see that there's curbside dining available, you know, after being cooped up for two months or so, there's a real impetus for individuals to walk to the restaurant and sit down at that, at that very same restaurant that they were purchasing from on the mm -hmm. app. Um, additionally, that you know, consumers will want to diversify what they're purchasing. They're not going to want to eat the same thing day, exactly. day in and day out. So we've also tended to see that um, there, there have been some spikes and lulls and, and shifts over time among specific consumers who are, who are looking to, to purchase in that way. Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages of your and, and other platforms is that you can do real-time tracking uh, you know, if you're a customer and you have visibility um, you know, through the delivery process. Uh, so that's been very important for e-deliveries in general. Um, but but I, I guess that goes all the way through the supply chain in terms of the sources of the goods and food, et cetera, and the and, and customers. Have you done anything different in this regard during this crisis? Or do you see that um, essentially what you had in place was pretty much doing the job or, and really as Postmates making perhaps more investments in these kinds of technologies? Yeah, so driving delivery efficiency has really been a focus for Postmates for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, in our key markets, we're looking to be able to get to a point where we're able to do multiple deliveries in the same transaction. That isn't to say trying to milk an individual to be able to do a number of deliveries or, or anything like that. It really has to do with how we're able to do bulk deliveries. You know, how can we make sure that our our fulfillment density is strong enough uh, that we're able to take two, three orders, four orders from a single location and have one individual drop them off sequentially, mm -hmm. or to be able to do them from nearby locations. So you do a single, uh, you do pick up A, you do pick up B, you do drop off B, and then you do drop off A. And those are ways in which we can make sure that um, fewer individuals are, um, are having to do those deliveries, removing cars from the road, for example, and be, being able to do it much more rapidly. Additionally, in uh, cities that have slow streets programs, for example, mm -hmm. Oakland, where I live, has a slow streets program. San Francisco has one as well. Mm -hmm. um, it can really be advantageous to have those fewer cars on the road so that they're able to traverse those neighborhoods in a way that's much more, uh, much more efficient and safely. Um, so that's been a priority for us. It's going to continue to be a priority for us. We're really looking at ways that we can uh, ensure that individuals are receiving their food quickly, that drivers are encountering as little friction as possible while doing those deliveries. It likely doesn't make sense. An individual should have to park five different times to be able to do a series of deliveries, especially in a dense area where they may have to circle the block and have high dwell times to be able to accomplish that. So we're very, very mindful of what that infrastructure looks like. Um, so we're gonna continue to invest in those spaces. Great. So I wanna go back to the demand side and sort of maybe uh, think long-term here. Uh, and of course, uh, during this crisis, where it's been m very much about day-to-day -day and you know what's the next week gonna be like and so on, but let's sort of think beyond that. And certainly there's a lot of interest and speculation the transportation planning community about the extent to which these home delivery patterns and more generally e-commerce will subsist post-crisis, whenever that might be. Uh, and that was, you know, what's sort of the stickiness of these customers that have started relying on e-deliveries during this period? And so the question is, do you really see a lasting shift to e-commerce purchases from consumers or will they revert 
uh, to their pre-crisis buying patterns? Or how much of that additional demand do you think might be retained over time? And as I try to think through it myself, I see essentially four types of customers, I guess. One, you know, those who started using it because they were concerned about health aspects during the lockdown. They didn't want to be out and so on. Others who might have been concerned just about shopping during the crisis. Uh, um, another group that uh, had, you know, scheduling constraints because of, you know, their work, ch children not being in school anymore. And so they started using more of the, the home delivery services. And then you have those who like me who just wanted the convenience really of having a home deliveries. And each of these will pre pre likely have different stickiness behaviors, I guess. Um, is that a fair way of looking at the demand? And is there anything from the marketing side, perhaps any insights that you could share with us? Yeah, I, uh, when, I, when we think about the stickiness, it's not so much whether, I, I think it's frequently people look at this as a difference between people using e-commerce platforms and going to the location. And I think those two are are different. I think decoupling this idea as though one is augmenting or, or, or sorry, not augmenting, but displacing the other is, is really important as, as we start looking at what the future of this landscape yes. looks like. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, because from the demand side, it's not so much whether demand exists. I think we, we know that it does because mm -hmm. we see people use platforms like Amazon on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, it's the more interesting question is how buying patterns will shift away from larger businesses and ones that um, may own their supply, for example, toward ones that are facilitating sales from those local businesses, especially as we see brick and mortar retailers potentially shutting down. We've seen, you know, their commercial corridors that have that are boarded up currently. And I think as those open back up, there's going to be a real interest among consumers to purchase from those local businesses that they now see as being on 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 really on the precipice or brink of of uh of some serious struggle so um that's where we really i think see the um the shift heading but I, additionally i think there's going to be some significant shifts in in terms of the ways in which our cities are designed mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is right now we've seen to go alcohol for example being um, uh, being available at many restaurants and, and businesses. We've seen that there have been streets that where a single, uh, two lanes of traffic are reduced to one lane of traffic. Mm -hmm. And then one of those lanes is used for dining and for parklets and for- Chicago's for, doing that quite a bit actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a real imagining of what our public space looks like. And of it reminds me- we can only do it in the summer in Chicago, but you know. Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting how it, yeah. how it looks a couple, like several months from now. But yeah. the anyway, yeah. Sorry, it, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. No, no worries. I think it's interesting because what this is going to do is I think it's really going to accelerate one specific sh one specific piece that we've been monitoring for a long time, which is that if you ask us where the e-commerce and delivery um, model will go. 10 years from now, five years from now, we really see it as moving towards some sort of hub and spoke model, especially in dense cities in which, you know, Market Street in San Francisco, for example, is closed off to street traffic. There has been a long discussion about what curb modernization looks like. How can we uh, account for space that's currently taken up by idle cars and move it toward being able to facilitate delivery transactions. Does it make sense in a commercial corridor for an individual to do the initial pickup on a bicycle or walking or to have a small delivery robot do the initial pickup and then go a couple of blocks down the road and do a drop off at a designated pickup point to another courier who is driving a car. Mm -hmm. So a, a little bit more of that hub and spoke model, I think is something that we're going to see over time. Mm -hmm. And as planning professionals start looking at cities um, similarly in, in, in terms of um, reclaiming that public space, mm -hmm. I think that's actually gonna drive this quicker because Essentially, when we look at Market Street in San Francisco, which is currently closed off to vehicular traffic, or, or, or is it um, Fourth Street or Sixth Street in, in Santa Monica, it's a similar situation. Um, those locations uh, are, are really ripe for reimagining the ways in which deliveries take place and really direct people toward using non-vehicular modes to be able to, to, be able to move 
throughout their cities safely. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately for us, our concern is, can we move people and goods safely, quickly, and um, preserve the integrity of the good that's being delivered? So mm -hmm. In order to do all of those things, I think a hub and spoke model really lends itself to be able to, to move that forward. So th I think that's going to be the real lasting shift and legacy that comes out of this. And we're going to really see a reclaiming of the public space in a way that's, that's really meaningful. Because when we think about what cities of the future looks, look like, if somehow to-go alcohol remains in some some markets, you'll see people actually like walking down our streets more frequently and you'll see less vehicular traffic as a result. You may see, you know, fewer DUIs specifically in those dense areas where someone in the past may have tried to drive to a specific location. The so reclaiming of the, uh, that that's where we're really going to see the lasting legacy of this. And we're going to see it with um, shifts in what mode split look like and the design of our, of our denser urban areas. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting connection, I think, that you're making here between reimagining cities, reimagining uh, streets, and the connection to e-delivery and this, the overall um, shopping patterns between sort of local versus more um, kind of corporate um, national level, uh, I think, companies. So it's very interesting. Let me ask you another question. Um, and this kind of ties in more with uh, some of the, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, social activism that you're that you're involved in How would you know the more recent concerns with uh, you know with the protests that we have seen and the concern with uh, social justice social equity etc how is that interacting uh, at all with with the kind of uh, home delivery work that postmates engages in certainly on the on the side of uh, the your 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 postmates your your, your uh, partners your employees uh, but or um, your 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 delivery agents uh, how, could you comment on that aspect uh, at all yeah, I think right now what's been interesting about the reignition of the civil rights movement is that mm -hmm. it's forcing us to think about not just, you know, performative examples of, hey, you know, we have hired a person of color, but rather what are the systems that we have in place to be able to mitigate against harm and to be able to drive goals of social of, of racial equity. Mm -hmm. And what that requires is a little bit of serious thinking and reflection in terms of the ways in which businesses operate. Mm -hmm. um, on the Postmates platform, for example, you know, I think very simply, you know, folks frequently think of us as just burrito delivery, you know, can I get a late night burrito? But uh, what does it mean when um, the restaurant that the burrito is being picked up from is uh, owned by an undocumented person or has undocumented folks who are working there? What does it mean when the individual who's doing the delivery themselves is someone who um, was formerly incarcerated and has a difficult time being able to find traditional forms of employment out there and is also taking care of a family so they can't work a traditional nine to five or have that sort of scheduling or, or strict uh, form of engagement with an employer. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, what, what does it mean for an individual who put in that order who is worried about the risk to their life in terms of going outside because of their gender presentation or because um, they're an individual who's worried that if they get stopped by the police that there may be some adverse consequence that will happen to them by virtue of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. um, what that means for us is, you know, we need to be thinking about that, even though we may simply be moving goods uh, throughout across our cities. And the ways in which we can do that aren't just, you know, having a diversity and inclusion officer at a company, which is, you know, of course, something that I think everyone is, is driving toward. But, but separate from that is, is looking at the ways in which these platforms function on a, on a more systemic level in terms of what are the changes that we can make, you know, that, that can be meaningful on a material level for in, individuals. I mentioned earlier that uh, black owned restaurants currently uh, were waiving commissions for them yeah. um, and additionally have free deliveries for customers who are, who are looking to frequent those restaurants. Um, it's a way of mitigate, mitigating against the impact that redlining, sort of traditional redlining and the lack of um, business capital that exists within black communities has led to um, the, sort, the sort of uh, situation where consumers themselves might not necessarily see those restaurants. Yeah. They, they miss them because they aren't in the part of town that they regularly order from because of 
the areas that uh, banks give loans to, right? Like these, these are large systemic questions. And for us, we can take these little steps that might cost us as a business a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it, when, when it comes to deciding that we're going to be waiving restaurant side commissions, you know, that's a, that's a direct, uh, you know, sort of cash transfer to those businesses, essentially saying, hey, we're here to support you at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think steps like that are really meaningful in trying to drive this conversation forward. But it's not just that. It's, um, you know, right now we've seen uh, not just DACA recipients being um, being threatened by uh, actions by the current administration, but additionally, you know, we had the um, the case involving uh, trans discrimination that just went to the Supreme Court. Um, Postmates has all written um, or has signed on to amicus briefs in both of those cases that have gone up to the Supreme Court. These are little steps that we can take to to uh, the, to push toward meaningful reform. Mm -hmm. And there's a final piece I want to talk to talk to about this, which is that. Um, you know, it's also meaningful for us as an employer that individuals that work on the platform, individuals that are receiving goods on platform, and those businesses are all able to thrive in a coherent ecosystem. So even in our own backyard of California, and in San Francisco specifically, we have, um, you know, forfeited our funds uh, on the Prop C tax, which was a which doubled the gross receipts tax on businesses to raise money to be able to offer um, uh, services to individuals that are challenged with housing or or houseless at this specific time. But additionally, um, we've also been supportive of Proposition 15, which is an effort to roll to reform um, the cap on. Um, on, on property taxes within the state of California. And what, it, what it'll do is it'll remove the cap on, on corporate uh, property taxes, and that'll be able to drive uh, significant investment into local schools, for example, which can have a tremendous impact within um, urban centers where there are both large numbers of corporations and businesses that exist, and there are also a number of schools that are struggling. So I think taking these steps can be a really meaningful um, move as, as a business to be able to um, push in the right direction. But I think this requires um, that not just us, but everyone have a little bit of skin in the game. So that's, that's really the way that we view this problem. And we're going to continue to push forward there. Thank you, Vignesh. I've, I've learned a lot from you. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for us? Yeah, you know, I think as as people look at this specific space, I presume that there's going to be individuals who are, um, you know, curious about regulation, about what the future of this this conversation looks like, people who are monitoring AB5 in, in California, for example. Mm -hmm. And I urge you all to think about, you know, what does this type of work look like 10 years down the road? Um, because, you know, the real value proposition for individuals that have been working in this space has been that you're able to earn income quickly without any requirement that you come back into work. That did that really is a novel idea. Simultaneously, I think it's important for us to think about what a social safety net looks like in this space. What are ways in which we can try and create a vision of what high road gig work looks like? Um, and that requires collaboration, not the sort of, I think, uh, public jabbing that you that you tend to see in in news outlets that really try and chase that sort of conversation but it requires that um, businesses like ours work with folks that are that have been working in the labor movement for a long time be able to share data to be able to talk about what uh people's work experience actually looks like and ultimately i think it requires us to think about um you know there's there's definitely a camp out there that believe that gig platforms simply shouldn't exist you know that that might be a position that that they want to defend, but for the you know five hundred thousand couriers that are on the Postmates platform that are looking for ways to be able to earn income, there aren't a lot of other um, avenues to be able to earn that sort of supplemental income on top of having a regular job. And I think if we're thinking about what the future of work looks like in this space, what we think of um, in terms of the disaggregation of work we need how do we come up with a social safety net that accounts for the disaggregation of work rather than thinking that the disaggregation itself is the problem so i, I really want to leave folks with, with with that question and um yeah thank you for having me that's a very good point thank you so much uh, appreciate your time today
Mike here, a uh, senior advisor at Farmers Ridge uh, and an investor advisor for, for multiple last mile food companies. Previously, you were a COO at Peapod, the online grocer for uh, over 19 years. And as COO, you worked across functional areas, evolving the business model and you know, so overseeing the, the growth of the company. Uh, prior to joining Peapod, you were principal at uh, AT Kearney, the management consulting firm, where you focused on business and marketing strategy for transportation companies. And prior to that, you were at Procter & Gamble. So you've really seen the transportation business, the delivery uh, business um, grow, and you've seen it from a variety of different angles. And of course, you are a graduate of the Kellogg uh, Graduate School of Management. So we're delighted to, uh, to, uh, to have you here with us today. Um, the first uh, question to better understand kind of your background in food delivery, uh, how has the last mile food delivery evolved from when you started at Peapod in 1997 to today, pre-COVID? So it's, it's obviously changed massively and it's changing exponentially, I would say. So it kind of changed slowly and has really accelerated even pre-COVID, but then with COVID, it's, it's put, put a turbo booster on it. Um, but the three big things that have changed is like the demand. With any business where you're doing delivery and you're trying to fill seats, if you don't have enough seats filled, it doesn't, it's not a good business, but if you have more demand, then, then it becomes a better business. Food retailers also viewed it as a necessary evil in restaurants. They're like, this is something we have to do. This is a pain, but it's something we have to do. And they're finally pivoting to say, wait, this is maybe an opportunity to retain customers, build relationships, you know, but it was really a necessary evil even two years back. And the other big thing is just the toolkit has become much different, you know, where you had to invent everything back in the day, but now there's so many tools that are being invented, both from like visibility, uh, technology from a um, consumer um, standpoint, from uh, just keeping products cold, things like that. So the toolkit is much better. So all of these have kind of come together to create an acceleration in the business at this point. You know, the one thing that hasn't changed, which is interesting, is you still have to pay people money. And so if it takes someone an hour to do something and you pay them $15, that's the hard that's the part that's like, yeah, all that up. So, so um, uh, Farmers Ridge is an exciting new company. Um, many people may not be familiar, I guess, with what it's doing. Could you explain to us the Farmers Ridge delivery and replenishment model and how it has evolved during this crisis? Sure. So Farmers Ridge is um, fresh food in a vending environment. So it, it makes, it shortens the supply chain. We're from market. And so, you know, shelf life for products is, is small because there's a long supply chain before it gets to the consumer. So we've shortened that supply chain. We make it in a cold room. We put it in a jar and we have chef inspired meals. So they're made fresh daily. And then they were in airports, in um, hospitals and major traffic. Um, as you can uh, imagine uh, with the current situation that has, that has changed a little bit. Um, but really the, uh, the thing that's evolving is it's still food, technology, and logistics coming together. So we know where every product is at every moment. We know where drivers are at every moment. We have a screen where we can target customers to buy certain products. So we're trying to take all of that technology that I mentioned um, and put it together in a new way to serve customers in a new way. Um, so it's interesting. So, um if, let's talk a little bit about the, the lockdown period, I guess, March through May. And during that period, of course, there was obviously a surge in e-commerce and home delivery of all sorts of products, initially special needs and essential home goods, then regular items. And of course, um, with restaurants closing down for on-site dining, uh, there was a pivoting to del deliveries, curbside pickups to sustain business. And similarly, in terms of delivery from uh, grocery stores because of uh, the population that's at risk and people who don't feel comfortable shopping and so on. From your vantage point, and not necessarily just farmers for it, but in, in general, from your knowledge of the industry, how did the last mile food delivery system perform during the early stages of the lockdown? I think it performed remarkably well. Um, sometimes survival creates focus, um, you know, so these restaurants had to do this and they have to figure it out or else you have zero business, you know, so that creates super high focus on something. And normally if you get creative people focused, you create like a lot of new pivoting and offerings and making it work. 
And so you've seen a lot of businesses pivot in an interesting way. Like I'll give you one example. There's, there's a smaller company called Fan Food where they did the last hundred yards of logistics at stadium where you could buy food and you could order your seat, they'll deliver it to your seat or you don't have to wait in line. They now are serving all these businesses like corporate cafeterias who don't want people waiting in lines. So you could order your food and have it delivered to your floor or a drive-in movie theater or a shopping mall. They can, you can get the product and drive through and pick it up. It's just an example of a pivoting business, you know, because they have this technology, now they're applying it to a new problem in a new way. Um, so you've seen a lot of that type of behavior, then also just scaling, you know, with it, with the increase in demand, you know, Instacart hired 300,000 people, you know, Walmart is accelerating in, in a big way. So with the volume and the scale, there's opportunity. And so you see a lot of the big players really pushing in to, you know, making it work and, and making it a go it's in food, grocery, then in restaurants, um, you know, Grubhub's gotten sold. Uh, Postmates got bought by Uber Eats. So again, they're like, it's scaling quickly and people are trying to figure out what does scale look like? And is it fast, better to buy, pay 2.6 billion for a company or build it ourselves? So you're seeing a ton of that activity and things kind of pivoting models and scaling are changing, really changing the industry. Um, the other thing that I've seen a little bit in Domino's is the best example of this. So during the pandemic, Domino's sales have gone up 16%. So they've gone up. Um, and what they're starting to do now is they're saying, where should we put stores to enable delivery versus how do we enable delivery from places we have stores? So it's really just changing in, in how they're looking at the ecosystem. So there's a lot of interesting innovation and change going on across the board. It's about time. They <laughs> look at the location problem, I would say. <laughs> logistics. logistics. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so would, would you say today's last night delivery models are... Um, or how resilient have they been in the face of COVID-like crises? So the last mile model is like, you know, I mentioned a little bit of it, but with that scaling and with what's going on, they've been resilient, but they've also had to, to grow quickly. You know, like when you're hiring 300,000 people, how do you execute? So I think there's definitely been, I'd say, like growth, growing pains, which as you had go for that fast of an acceleration. So some of the risk is if the execution isn't good, the consumer tries it and says it wasn't good. You know, it didn't, it wasn't executed well. But overall, it's been pretty good. Consumers are relatively patient. Again, when you're forced into this and you maybe don't have an option, if you don't want to go to the grocery store or get, you, know, go, you can't go to a restaurant, you'll be patient with the service you're getting. But I think it'll be important um, you know, to, for the service levels to stay high, for, for really to be able to retain that volume. Um, the one thing you're starting to see too with the, uh, the models as they become resilient if it, if it, you know, back to my $15 example, if you pay someone $15 and it takes them an hour and, and, you're, and the rest you're getting paid $8, you know, that's not a good model necessarily. So you're starting to see uh, some innovation. There's, a, there's a, a really interesting company called Milkman. It was in Italy, is coming to the US and they're creating like tiered pricing and different alternatives. So if you can wait five hours or if you can wait two hours, you have different prices. Applying a lot of airline industry inf you know, information of how do you fill a seat to yield manage your business mm -hmm. and applying it to restaurant as opposed to every seat's the same price mm -hmm. and it's for really fast service. So you're starting to see some early indications of tiering, but it's still pretty much you order, you get it as fast as you can, and that's a model overall. So I think it's evolution in that kind of tiering of service over time. So looking at the latter part of the crisis and the current situation, say the June, July period, again, with your view to the food industry, uh, of course, we've seen a greater demand for grocery, restaurant delivery, et cetera, compared to pre-COVID. But um, how has this evolved through this period? And has this demand surge, I guess, subsided? Or is it pretty much still at the same levels? Yep, it's at a similar level. So sales are up, like in grocery, about five times year over year. Um, and then even in May, it was up 18% month over month, you know, so it's still growing and it's maintaining at those levels. Um, and the spend per order is up like 25%. So you're seeing a lot of lift, obviously, and, and some of it's being forced. But I think the other thing that's happening, and it's been the best time ever to acquire customers, you know, to do something. And as people get trial, they thought, oh, I would never use this. I, I would never get food online. But as they try it, it works. You know, so a lot of things that happen with shoes and fashion, and it's like, well, I would never do that. You know, and then they try it, and like, well, that was pretty good. And so that's starting to happen with food now. So I think 
people didn't want to try, but since they've tried, they're, they're starting to stick with it and they're putting it into their portfolio of shopping. Food is such a massive, massive industry that it's not going to be 100% of what they do, but it'll be part of their portfolio function. Mm -hmm. So looking at the supply chain side of things, uh, and particularly at Farmers Fruits, for example, um, and, and particularly looking at the, at the sourcing aspects of it, um, we've heard, of course, about um, both instances of where there was surplus production that was being destroyed or whatever, yep. as well as shortages of meat when there, when there, when there were um, infections and so on. Um, what has been your experience uh, in that regard? Again, in terms of farmer's fridge, have you sure. experienced sourcing challenges from your food suppliers? Um, and um, have these been sort of similar across the country? And I, I know your focus is more regional here, but uh, how sort of can you, have you seen any kind of differences between even the markets where farmer's fridge is operating? Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, overall, it's not been a huge issue. So the base supply chain, this is again, like farmer's fridge is fresh food. So a, a great Napa salad, with avocado in it, things like that. So there's been certain maybe blips in time, like a week or certain like issues have happened, but nothing sustained. And I think you hit on the key point. For fresh food, you had this huge mount monster market called the restaurant. Industry. It suddenly like didn't have as much volume. And so where did all that fresh food that went into making those products go? So just pivoting and trying to find like, what's the contract? What's the supply chain? How does that work? So there was some of those blips going on, but in general, the supply chain hasn't been too bad. Like it's been fine, actually. That's not been a major, major issue. It's been more on the selling side, you know, we sell at an airport and the airport's, you know, doing no, no has no passengers. So that's, that's been more the issue than on the supply so side. Have, so have prices for uh, your food inputs gone down because of, of, of that? During no, the I don't think we've seen it gone down. I think it just hasn't changed that much. The market hasn't, you know, a lot of this was built to happen so fast Mm -hmm. that um, I don't think that like the contracts and everything else, we'll see what unfolds, you know, kind of the next quarter or so, but you might see that as the supply and demand is shifted, but sometimes like contracts and relationships are continuing on and you just want to make sure you're getting serviced and everyone's also pivoting their businesses. So they're solving live where farmer surge went way down, then started delivery and went way back up. So within weeks, you're ordering a lot less, you're ordering a lot more. So it's, it's really a changing environment. And so you just try to stay close to your current suppliers. Is what you're doing. So uh, looking ahead uh, in the near to medium term, primarily, uh, and now from your, the, your vantage point as an observer, I guess, of the last mile delivery industry, and also of course, as a veteran of that industry, uh, how would you compare the last mile delivery strategies provided by a Postmates or an Instacart? which deliver for multiple stores. And incidentally, uh, uh, Postmates is also participating in this uh, roundtable with us uh, versus uh, dedicated delivery services for say Target or Peapod's model, which had its own truck, you know, delivered only for, for, for its own uh, um, uh, items. So what would be the sort of advantages and disadvantages of each? And which sure. one do you see sort of prevailing uh, going forward? Sure. And I'll, I'll make sure to stay positive about Postmates since there, there'll be a, a presentation before or after me on this. Um, but no, both of them can, can be, play a key role. So the advantages is they're plug and play. So if you're a retailer and your job is to say, get food, sell food, like tech, logistics, last mile is not your core proposition. You know, So they can, you can get sign up Postmates or Instacart and you're immediately up and running where it may take you three years or four years and you have to attract talent and you know build your own infrastructure and build your own engine. So it's a great um, instant start. And that's why, again, like Instacart, I know has hired 300,000 people. I'm sure Postmates has hired many, many, many people too during this time. So it allowed a lot of businesses to pivot quickly um, in a very positive way. But long-term there's a cost for that back to my $15 an hour for a person. So if you're delivering an $80 order and it took an hour, you know, how much do you need to charge on a percentage basis? So they might have to charge, you know, 10, 15% for food or 25 to 30% to a restaurant. So for business, you know, short term, it's great. You get all this stuff and get it done. But long term, um, and also the customer goes into Instacart first. They don't come to your site first, you know, so it's between you and the customer. So again, a lot of positives to it and relationships to some extent. So companies like Peapod, you know, it's owned by Ahold, major uh, $50 billion U.S. company in grocery on the East Coast. Um, and um, uh, uh, Target, you know, have built um, businesses where you look at the whole ecosystem. 
you know, I mentioned for um, uh, Domino's, for example, you know, how are they, how are they built and how did they build that ecosystem? It's a similar thought for Peapod, you know, so we picked from grocery stores at the beginning, but grocery stores aren't built, or picked, actually terrible. They're 60,000 square feet, the products spaced really far apart, you know, and so you, to find things, you're bumping into other shoppers. Um, it's not the best logistical uh, proposition available. So it works great at the beginning because you're close to customers, but as you scale, have dark stores, how do you do that? So companies like Target, you know, they realize, hey, all our inventory is to customers, so we use that inventory and use that for delivery. So if you step back and you look at the whole ecosystem, companies like Target and Ahold with Peapod have looked at it that way, which is a longer view, but it's taken many years to do all that work. And it's very hard to do that quickly. I think you'll see companies continue to do that. I think Postmates and Uber e or um, and, uh, Instacart and others can play roles in that. Because of the efficiencies of scale that you need to put in place. So you alluded earlier to one of my favorite topics, which is real-time tracking uh, and uh, the importance of having visibility throughout the supply chain and the delivery process. Uh, and certainly that's quite very important for e-deliveries, both, both you know, working with the sources of goods and food, as well as in terms of the end customer. What has changed in this area over the years and what is working well? Where is more innovation needed? Sure. I think it's, What's interesting now, it's just become table stakes. Like you have to have it. And you know, the things that have changed, you know, all the stuff of uh, cost of technology is down, the cost of uh, data transmission is down, storage is down, almost nothing. And so something that used to be this really heavy lift has like, there's tools you can buy off the shelf and you can store all the information and transmit all the information quickly. So that's created these table stakes. And obviously Amazon and others have just set the consumer expectation that way. So I think having visibility has become just a given. The thing that's evolving is what to do with it. You know, how do I orchestrate this? Well, how do I change it? What do I do? And not enough to let the customers know, hey, your driver's two minutes away. It's do you create different service offerings? How do you, I have a truck with extra capacity between two o'clock and three o'clock. Should I inject an order in there that they can go pick it up and then deliver it? You know, how do I make this whole ecosystem work? So I think that's the next chapter, the, the, uh, the, the wow of like, wow, there's my driver, look at him coming to my house, you know, it's just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Now it's, now it's what to do with it. And that's why these companies like the Milkman I mentioned, there's a lot of other companies doing it, but how do I orchestrate and change demand and use that visibility? Like at Farmer's Fridge, we know when a product's gonna go off, off, off like the uh, 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 supply, the uh, end date, the expiration date will hit. So we yeah. can do a burst to customers and let them try it. So it's really changing at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, going back to the demand side, and that's probably more speculative at this point, there's a lot of interest um, and speculation in the transportation planning community, but the extent to which these home delivery services and more generally e-commerce will continue post-crisis, whatever, whenever that might be at this yep. point, so nobody knows that uh, exactly. But do you foresee a lasting shift to e-commerce purchases from consumers? And then we're talking specifically about sort of the, the, the food space, or will they revert back to their pre-crisis buying patterns? And probably the answer is somewhere in between, I guess, but do you have a, a, any basis at this point for assessing how much of that additional demand might be retained over time? I think about maybe two thirds to three quarters would be retained. This, this trend was already happening. This accelerated the trend. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, I don't think it's going back. A lot of this is like conversation you hear that, that you could, could have been the same conversation on buying shoes or something 10 years ago. It's like, well, who's going to do that? Is it going to go back? Are they really going to do that if the shoes don't fit? You know, it's just like these things will happen over time. You know, groceries, a $600 billion industry. So it, it might be just a small sliver, like $40 billion going this way, but it's, um, it's still going to be a major part in consumers now, especially younger consumers, they just expect it. And then older consumers who maybe wouldn't have tried it have tried it now and said, wow, this, this works pretty well. So you see huge investments, Kroger is investing with Ocado, changing their whole infrastructure for delivery, building like, you know, tens of warehouses around the country, takeoff technologies, doing tests with automated picking warehouses with grocers already. You know, Amazon with Whole Foods has changed like all their infrastructure, Walmart's changing what they're doing. So it's all happening in a major way. It's not going away and it's going to get, when the service gets better, more customers will come to it and the service is getting better. So really that's what's happening. And then, 
you know, people see the demand and they see this is the future and the economics for food will require it. If you lose 10% of your sales in a grocery store, that store is in big trouble. So this is a way they have to have to pivot. So you're gonna see a ton of innovation continue in the space, I think. Interesting. So as cities continue to reopen, uh, I'm looking again specifically at Farmer's Fridge at this point, how will Farmer's Fridge services change? How will its strategy change? And what have you learned through the COVID crisis? Sure. It's interesting for Farmer's Fridge. I mentioned at the beginning, it's kind of this orchestration of food, technology, logistics, next generation, multi-day shelf life product. And what we've seen already is with office buildings closing and airports, it's forced us to get into the home delivery business. And it's been a, a good win because consumers get it. It can fit in their fridge because it's compact. And it can fit in a vending machine so it can fit in their fridge and it has multi-day shelf life. So we found a new service, which is home delivery of, of food. Also, the salad bars aren't coming back anytime soon. People touching, you know, multi same utensils or sharing food. So both for consumers in food stores, there's been a ton of interest, a lot of conversations we're having now about what's the future of fresh food, you know, and, and <clears throat> what's grab and go look like and how do you make it great and how do you have it fit? So I think <clears throat> grocery stores and food stores are also figuring it out. So I think you're gonna see a lot of innovation that maybe was consumers would have wanted, but was uh, different with salad bars and then it'll really change going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, as usual, I've learned a lot from you. Uh, it's been very informative. Um, do you have any final thoughts for us? Sure, I think it's an amazing, unprecedented time. You know, demand <clears throat> creates opportunity. With all this demand flooding in, there's a, just so much innovation. And I think you're gonna see like continued, like interesting models, like companies that didn't exist 10 years ago, like you know, Instacart, Postmates, whoever it is, are now like major players in the, in, the, in, the, in the industry. And I think you'll continue to see that over the next couple of years, but even in a faster basis. Excellent. Well, thank you very much and I uh, wish you all the best going forward. All right, great. Thank Thanks, Johnny. Great. Okay, great. This is uh, the part where uh, we go live. Um, once our uh, panelists uh, join us. So our um, Senior Associate Director, Brett Johnson, um, will be um, monitoring the uh, Q&A line uh, and then addressing the questions to our panelists today. And I do see that we have uh, Mike Brennan with us. We have Vignesh, uh, welcome. Uh, and I see that Susan Sweat is also uh, here with us, so uh, delighted to have all three of our uh, panelists with us today. Let's give it a few seconds till uh, Susan and Mike uh, are fully, I guess, on the call. Yes. Okay, here he is. Great. Yeah, I'm on the call. Perfect. Susan, are you are you on? I am. I'm here. Yes. He all right. Great. Welcome. Perfect, thank you. So, um, Brett, I believe you've been receiving a few questions here. Do you want to um, start with the lead, lead off with the first one? Sure, and I just wanna, I think Mike's got his clean room outfit on. <laughs> uh, sure, so uh, let me start with this first question from one of our graduate students, uh, Moen Hosseini, uh, who asks, as schools and universities start to reopen, especially in some hybrid format, are there specific changes that you're expecting to happen in your company? What are the initiatives that your company has devised to address these changes? Um, why don't we start with uh, Susan? Well, first of all, we were very affected by the school situation. I mean, we weren't able to bring on our interns over the summer. Uh, groups that we would normally uh, use through the universities, et cetera. So um, universities are a huge part of our de uh, delivery business, especially when the kids are getting back on campus. I mean, it's nothing for us to set up trailers and, and have them come by and pick up their stuff. It's amazing what people ship to themselves at college. Um, <coughs> so what we'll be doing is following whatever guidelines the institution outlines for us. Um, Depending on the institution, they've all established their own return to uh, campus guidelines. And uh, some of them want us to just use one area. Some of us 
some of them will allow us to have more free reign over the campus. So it really, uh, but obviously, uh, our goal is to make sure that uh, the returning students have what they need, books, clothes, furniture, whatever they decide to send to themselves, that they have that when they get there. Not to mention care packages from parents. That too, and money, yes. Or care packages that contain money, <laughs> checks. Okay. Nash, do you have a response? Yeah, I think, I think for us, there's two different aspects of this. I think one of the major shifts is that, especially on college campuses, which tend to be a large hub for on-demand food delivery, um, that you know this is just simply gonna take the orders that have been currently fulfilled in sort of suburban areas and urban centers and kind of move them into those college towns from which I think platforms like ours have been able to, to grow pretty significantly. Um, but the second piece of this is that I think to date, we've been engaging in a number of activations with local school districts um, to make sure that we're able to get food to um, students and families that, that need it. I mean, ultimately, um, especially for households in which you may have parents who are both uh, deemed essential services and, and are having to work through the through the pandemic, um, you know, they may have children at home that, uh, you know, need their lunches delivered and, and their school districts that currently still have the ability to prepare those lunches is just getting them from the school to the home that's really been the problem for them. So we've been working on those solutions in a number of, of, of our markets um, with, you know, in, in the past, we've worked with LA Unified School District, especially during, during the teacher strike last year on getting, um, getting meals to, uh, um, to homebound students. Um, but this isn't just for students, right? We have senior citizens, we have um, individuals who may have ambulatory challenges who, um, who are looking for ways to have food delivered to them as well. Um, not to mention individuals who may be COVID positive and have to quarantine. So I think all this does is change where the demand is headed more than anything else, but we continue to keep those services active and are always available for um, local school districts, universities to, to partner with, um, to see how we can, we can help enable getting food to those populations. Mike, are there any plans to have fridges on university campuses? Yeah, there's, there's already fridges on university campuses. The thing that's evolving now and what's changing is that um, We've had a, multiple campuses contact us about really, I mentioned about the, the death of the salad bar. Like, is there a way to put salads in to the university cafeterias so the students can grab and go fresh, you know, healthy food? And so like University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, those kind of com uh, campuses, perhaps Northwestern. Northwestern, you know, yeah, uh, really. Yeah. Yes, you know, to do that. But it's both, you know, that's, that's a big change. So they're looking at how, what's the alternative solution where you can have healthy but low touch food. Um, and so there's kind of new innovations that's, that are unfolding because of that. Interesting. Thank you. Brett, do you have other questions? Uh, I do. Um, so one of the other questions is, uh, Maya would like to know, uh, have any of your companies had to spend extra, uh, had to spend extra in terms of training uh, or and dealing with equipment for cleaning due to COVID. I mean, how, just how are you addressing the safety issues at your different companies? I mean, you're, you operate completely different operations. So I'll, I'll take that first. Um, okay, thanks, Susan. <laughs> obviously, we have more than, gosh, 600 locations across uh, the domestic U.S. and we have partnered in all of those areas with uh, vendors that provide that. We, we feel like that um, COVID uh, deep cleaning is not our specialty um, and we're not qualified to do that. Uh, therefore, we are partnering with uh, local organizations that provide that service. And we are very uh, diligent about that. And there's no room for shortcuts in that area. So yes, we have incurred a large but necessary expense in ensuring that work areas are clean uh, after there has been a, a positive uh, COVID test. So Vignesh, for, uh, for, post, for Postmates, um, did, did uh, the uh, agents, the, the Postmates undergo any special training? 
Yeah, so um, what we had to do, I think there was, you know, I, I mentioned during the initial Q&A mm -hmm. that or the um, uh, dialogue that we had that there was, uh, there was a period during which we were competing with state and, and local governments and, and the federal government trying to obtain PPE for our careers. Um, you know, I think for, for most uh, folks in the private sector, there was there were significant challenges there in terms of the supply chain and making sure that we were able to get quality supplies. Once we obtained them, we have made them available for free to Postmates careers. Um, um, you know, due to some of the questions around employee classification, independent contractor classification, we can't like force them to wear it. We can't do that, those, take those types of steps. However, we do strongly incentivize it. Um, we also uh, have mandated contactless drop-offs, meaning that, you know, the um, each career uh, does not necessarily interact with, with the end consumer on, on the sales of, uh, on, on the delivery of of any of these items. Um, but I think furthermore, you know, this is actually an interesting question moving forward, especially because, you know, we've seen um, legislation introduced in a number of jurisdictions that take sort of the existing food handler card matrix and tries to apply it to food delivery drivers, which is a bit of a, a misfit because it um, the existing food handler license is really designed for you know take for handling raw foods raw materials um, you know if you're working in the back of the house at a deli for example you would you would get a food handler card um, the challenge is trying to figure out how we're able to build out that sort of infrastructure for folks who do deliveries and especially for the postmates fleet for whom you know 89 percent are working three to five hours a week how can we make sure that they're actually getting that training? How can we build it into the app? Is there a way to say, hey, these are the best practices for, um, for keeping uh, food safe? Um, you know, we have hot carry bags that are provided. We have a number of other uh, provisions that make sure that uh, the food is, uh, is, is not touched by an individual as possible. And all of these, all of these items are, are packaged by the restaurant. So um, that's sort of where we stand. We're currently working on ways in which we can try and improve that. I think over the next couple of years, we're hopefully sooner, we're gonna, we're gonna try and um, work on rolling out some standards there. Mike, does Postmates uh, yeah. handle all its own deliveries, or do you work with third parties? Uh, we're doing, we're handling our own deliveries right now. We're starting mm -hmm. to work with um, third parties, looking at like as the business grows, looking at all alternative models with partnering for like last quarter mile type mm -hmm. thing. The other thing too related to COVID, I wanted to share was the fridges. You know, you, you have to touch it; it's a touch screen, and then it vends. So we had to change the tech where it's touchless. You can come from the app. You can enter the number when you get close to the fridge and it just comes out. You don't even have to touch anything except the, the, the own jar that comes for you. So we like have touchless vending now that we spun up very quickly. So, you know, there's no consumers touching the same thing at the fridge. And obviously with food production, as is being discussed at some level, that's super important, you know, to make sure you have all the masks, all the temperature checks, everything else, like on the production side, there was a huge amount of effort on that part of it. But you'll see more and more of this kind of like, what's the no touch way to do something, you know, whether it's delivery or vending even. So that's, that's live now. We had to figure that out in like two weeks and now it's live on all the fridges. Interesting. Brett, next. Yes, this question comes from Eric Shen. I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit. Uh, he's wondering as, you know, as private companies, uh, do you see any for, uh, foresee any changes to uh, city zoning codes uh, based on what we've been doing, maybe to reshift lanes and cities like that, that may exist uh, post COVID to support more last mile delivery. I guess we'll give this one to Vignesh first. Can you repeat that? Um, I just wanna yeah, make sure the, I'm answering it right. Yeah, the question is, um, what do private companies see uh, with respect to existing or legacy zoning codes that may be changed to accommodate the new norm post COVID-19? If we assume the new norm is much more uh, delivery to home, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a couple of things. Um, we've seen a number of jurisdictions that uh, you know and markets for us that have rolled out what, what are called slow streets programs, where um, streets have been shut down specifically uh, to car traffic, so that individuals on bicycles or skateboards or um, electric scooters or, or other provisions are able to move around really quickly and safely. I think that's really going to motivate companies like ours to be able to move in that sort of hub and spoke direction that I was speaking to earlier. Um, but additionally, you know, um, with parklet space becoming increasingly a way for individuals to uh, 
to be able to eat outdoors. Um, you know, there's uh, there's questions about how do we build out more parking spaces for individuals to pick up and load. So I think this is really going to drive the curb modernization piece of, of urban development. When it comes to zoning, I think um, ultimately um, the more commercial and residential corridors are zoned together, the easier it is to be able to deliver just because delivery distances become shorter naturally. Um, so that's, I, but I think that was the case pre-COVID as well. So it's, it's not that anything is different per se there, but there may be some incentive, I think, among the planning community to rethink some of those pieces and make sure that, you know, if we're able to rezone those neighborhoods, people have, don't have to travel as far, especially for individuals that don't have traditional modes of transportation, to be able to receive, to be able to pick up food. And in that way, we can actually prevent some of the, um, you know, some of the contact that people make along the way. Susan? One, one other... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. I was, I was going to add one other point on that. I think, you know, like the, the points about how the whole ecosystem is changing too. This is just in the restaurant world. We see cloud kitchens, other things coming up where restaurants are in high traffic areas, but now more and more restaurants are like, well, why don't we move our production to a low traffic area where we can get faster pickup and delivery? So you're seeing s some ecosystem changes from the supply side of the business to even before kind of the cities are adapting to you know, uh, delivery from, from existing restaurant infrastructure. So just want to add that in. Interesting. Susan? I think the, the guys covered it. I mean, anytime there's disruption to our normal delivery schedule, we adapt, whatever that happens to be. And uh, our local operators certainly stay in, in tight contact with uh, local governments to know what those changes are going to be so that we can uh, try to get ahead of them. Um, but in the in the larger cities, walking more is not a bad thing for us. Uh, I mean, we we want to pile as many people into a truck as we can, give them their load, and let them go. So, more walking is not a bad thing for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brett. What do you have next? Um, I have a question for Mike from Jim Corboy who asked Mike, he says, has uh, Farmer's Fridge redeployed some of uh, its vending machines from locations that are closed for now uh, to locations where, there, where demand is seeing increases? Uh, for example, uh, are you moving any of your, dish, your fridges to 24-7 uh, frontline workers that are dealing, you know, such as in hospitals? And uh, so yeah, so... So a couple things have happened, like with uh, right as the pandemic hit, we did 30,000 meals a week to frontline workers where we put mini, mini fridges at different levels where they didn't have to take off the PPE and they could like get fresh, nutritionally dense food. So we actually set it up where we took out the fridge as the standard vending fridge and put it into just normal mini fridges on different floors of hospitals. And we're doing upwards of like 30,000 meals a week there. Um, and then also have pivoted to like home delivery, as I mentioned, but it just, so there's the actual fridges, but it's more of the jars and the food. And is there a way to get food to frontline workers, get food to people who are working from home? So that's where that we've changed it. It's actually the fridge has gone away, but we've now gotten the food to consumers where they are, where they're, the need is um, during this time and have pivoted those ways. Thanks, so Mike. I'm receiving my first uh, home delivery of uh, farmer's fridge cats tomorrow so I'll, I'll, I'll share your, 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 your life is going to get better so that's awesome I'll be hugged. Uh, Maya has this question for Vignesh um, she wants to know Vignesh she says since uh, Postmates are not full-time employees of the company uh, did you have to change your recruitment or pay options to get enough Postmates to meet the demand that you were seeing um, so that's, it, it depends on the market. I think, I think in some ways, um, it, it's a good question. Um, you know, for us, uh, the, you know, the demand is sort of fluctuated depending on the market. There's some places that, you know, it was grocery that increased, meaning there were, you don't have as many drivers that would necessarily be fulfilling those. Whereas when you're doing, you know, individual food items, they're individual meals, um, in, in locations where people were ordering from restaurants, that number, we would need more drivers in order to be able to fulfill that. The, um, so in some ways we would set up some incentives to do that, but I think COVID has also shown a different need in terms of um, the American workforce, right? I mean, ultimately, um, you know, we, we have a situation where most Americans really 
have gotten what between six hundred and twelve hundred dollars um, to be able to tide them over for four months. Um, and for individuals who are furloughed or unemployed at this time, um, you know, they're looking for other avenues to be able to work, especially where their unemployment allocation might not necessarily be equal to how much they were making before. So, you know, if you're someone um, who's who's stretched to the point where you know your rent cover is is about half of your income and you lose your job, your unemployment is really not even going to be able to fully cover your rent. You're not going to be able to feed yourself. So for many of those folks, they've been looking for other avenues to be able to work. And, um, you know, so for us, we've also seen an 84% uptick in the number of people who are hopping on the platform to be able to earn. Um, you know, and I think it's important to remember here that this is, uh, it's a bigger question than just Postmates. It's, it's a question about the economy as a whole is how we're able to create sustainable growth in, in, a, in, a, in a way that doesn't leave workers behind, especially because, um, you know, as uh, if, if another pandemic like this happens in the future, if we see a, um, you know, a second, a second wave, as I think we are seeing right now, um, what does that mean for individuals when, when the safety net's not necessarily meeting their needs? Um, you know, many of them are going to hop onto platforms like ours, but, you know, at the same time, we've also been advocating for, um, you know, forms of Medicare for all, for ways in which we can actually shore up the social safety net so that individuals don't have to necessarily do so. Because, you know, for us, if our labor force is increasing by 84%, that could have a negative impact on the number of jobs that are available for workers as well. So there's this delicate balance that we really have to maintain where workers are still able to receive work um, while uh, people don't necessarily have to hop on because they're struggling, but rather because they want the additional income. Do you have formal ways that, I mean, this, this balance, I guess, between the supply and the demand uh, of kind of matching those, or uh, is that pretty much a, a sort of a judgment call? Yeah, so we use, um, so that's essentially, I think, what most platforms like ours do, right, is, is we come up with ways to incentivize individuals to work when there's work available and try and disincentivize people from working when there isn't work available, because there's, you're not, you know, if, if you're someone who's looking to be able to deliver on Postmates at 3 a.m. on a, on a Monday morning um, in, uh, you know, um, um, in Omaha, um, I don't know how many orders are actually going to be coming through. Um, meanwhile, if you're someone who's looking for something in between your workday ending at, you know, 5 p.m. and you have your, your kid is uh, in an after school program that ends at 630 or 7 and you're looking for ways to be able to supplement your income during that gap, it's really, you know, there will be a lot of orders that are coming in because it's dinner time and people are going to be asking for food to be delivered at that time. So, um, you know, we're, it, it depends on the market. It depends on, um, you know, how many people we see on the platform. Um, you know, Super Bowl Sunday, we tend to see a ton of orders come in, which means we, um, we have a lot of incentives and bonuses for individuals to hop on the platform. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Uh, Arnold Kazimar uh, Sarn asks, uh, have there been any anticipated hazards or changes that have been experienced by delivery drivers or other operations during the pandemic? Uh, maybe we could start with Susan. I'm sorry, Brett, uh, say it again. I didn't hear the last part. Sure, um, I'll, I'll say it a little bit more slowly too. Um, okay. Have there been any anticipated hazards or changes that have been experienced by your delivery drivers or other operations during the pandemic? Well, I, I think, I don't think they're unanticipated uh, hazards. I think they're hazards of the job. Um, anytime you have a, you're in a employment where you're going to be having interface with customers or uh, you work in an environment where other people are working, um, the hazard is going to be that exposure to those people. Um, so I don't think it's an unanticipated hazard, um, but it, it does make people more cautious as, as far as using their PPE, as uh, Vingesh mentioned, with masks and gloves and uh, wipes and all of those things that make people feel better uh, as far as their interaction with with others and the general public. So I don't think they're unanticipated. Uh, I certainly admire all of our organizations and the people that we have out there on the front lines who are day to day interacting with other people to to bring something to those people, whether it be food package, whatever the case may be. 
um, they're, they're really the ones that are, are shouldering the responsibility for many of the communities, quite frankly. I guess, Susan, you, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, other than the sort of the risk of infection and, and, and disease transmission, you'd mentioned, for instance, that some of your uh, shippers didn't want to receive uh, any more, or, you know, didn't want to yeah, receive any more goods because their warehouses were full, et cetera. I mean, that's a different, I guess, kind of uh, operational uh, issue, uh, which may translate into a hazard for, for some drivers who may be sort of counting on making a certain delivery. Now they find that they can't make it and it kind of backs up, I think, the, their entire operation. Were, were there issues like that? for instance, or personal safety kind of issues that may be arising because, other than the risk of infection, but other kind of uh, issues related to that, where they don't want a driver from a certain you know, part of town or from a certain area, which has probably a higher infection rate. I know in the New York area, they've had some of those issues. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the hot spots, as we call them, certainly those are issues. And as far as the warehousing goes, that Mostly that's attributed to customers who just closed their operations because they didn't have people there to work, they couldn't receive. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, like you said, then we are trying to warehouse and the driver is certainly uh, not running their route as they normally would. So mm -hmm. yeah, those were just unanticipated on a, on a daily basis because you never knew which day a customer was going to be closed, uh, either permanently or on, at a, for a certain period of time. So. Yeah, those were day-to-day -day operational mm -hmm. issues that we did face, or mm -hmm. that our employees faced. Thank you. Mike, any thoughts on that? Yeah, we had just on, in general, like the, like where were the special circumstances? I mentioned we had food delivered every floor of a hospital to frontline workers. The trouble is someone had to deliver that food and go into the hospital, you know, so it's like they had to almost be dressed like a medical worker to deliver food. So. It's like there's obviously the hotspot cities, and then there's hotspot locations in hotspot cities. So then we had to say, how do we accommodate and make sure we're taking all the precautions and doing all the right things for employees, given those type of needs. So that's that's the kind of stuff that we were running into, um, you know, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Big Nash. Yeah. So this isn't as um, tied into directly with the, with the pandemic, but I, I think um, one of the, I mean, with the pandemic, I think we did see some challenges with, with slow streets programs rolling out really quickly. Um, and so some cities, uh, trans, uh, transportation planning folks reached out to us. So Oakland, for example, San Francisco, we had, uh, they reached out in advance and said, we're rolling out a slow streets program. Um, since y'all are deemed essential, so long as the delivery is happening to or from a location that's along the slow street, you're good. Um, but I think having active communication is really important. Um, you know, we don't have a team that's monitoring for that. Um, so it, it might not cross our path. Um, and then, you know, we don't want to end up in a situation where a courier is getting stopped, getting ticketed for something that, you know, they couldn't have known about. Um, so we have the ability to actually message out on that. Um, the second part of this was, I, I think, over the course of the last several months, as we've seen protests across the country, um, the that's had an effect on workers not necessarily knowing whether they're safe in a specific location, what happens when there's a curfew, um, you know, and, and people are ordering food because there's also a pandemic going on. Um, you know, how do you account for that? And um, there isn't a ton of guidance that comes from local governments. Local governments are just trying to block and tackle the fact that there's people in the streets in the first place. So they're not thinking with that level of foresight necessarily, um, which requires us to do a lot of additional communicating really quickly. Um, and sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's not, right? I think frankly, like if, if we had all the information, we would be able to provide that, but we, we, we try and mitigate the risk as, as much as possible. So I think that's been one of the, the larger challenges that we've seen. Um, we were the first pro, uh, platform to roll out contactless delivery in, in our space, um, which, you know, I, I think was a, was a good proactive step to take because um, that way, you know, we were able to keep both workers on the platform and our customers safe. Thank you. Brett, are there any more questions? Or are we getting ready? Well, somewhat, somewhat related to the, uh, Vignesh's answer here and the previous zoning question, uh, Johns, uh, Jocelyn Jones wanted to know uh, if any of the panelists are involved with public sector groups, local, state, regional, to discuss transportation and freight movement issues. And I'll add to that, if not you, do you have uh, anyone, you know, do you have people at your companies dedicated to that? And 
if you don't, ha do, you, do you see it, you know, a, a, a larger need for that based on what you've experienced during the pandemic? So we have groups, like that? Yeah, we have groups that do that um, for all of our opcos. So whether that be freight or express air, uh, we have groups that do that and, and work with those, those government departments and agencies. So yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Vignesh? Yeah, I mean, to the extent possible. Yeah, I think same answer. I just want to add to that. I appreciate FedEx and Postmates figuring this out. So then a small company like Farmers Fridge can ride behind that. Um, but the other thing we're seeing, Vignesh brought this up, they don't know how to handle food delivery. So when we opened up vending machines in New York, they said, you're a restaurant. So they're like, the drivers have to have a sink on the truck so they can wash their hands. And we're like, but the jars aren't opened, you know? So it was, but there's a certain regulation and sometimes they force fit um, a new idea into an old regulation of, is it a restaurant worker? It's like, no, they're just delivering food. So, so I think there's, it was, so, so every, every fridge we put into New York has a restaurant license. And, it's, and we have to go through the same approvals of a restaurant and they didn't change it, we just had to adapt. And then we have to have ways they can wash their hands. So it's just that type of regulation is the other thing. The world is changing, but the regulatory system isn't necessarily built for that. So those are some yeah. challenges. That... Mike, did they charge you based on square footage of the restaurant? Well, as we say, we're the world's smallest restaurant, so that, sh that should help, but they had to inspect <laughs> each one. It was, it was a very long process, so it was a little crazy, but you gotta, you can't, fight the government necessarily. On that, so. yeah, can I ch chime in here real quick? Um, Mike, you actually bring up a really good point, which is for individuals who are watching who um, may be practitioners on the GR side, uh, on the government relations side, or working um, at mobility providers or um, you know, uh, uh, delivery platforms or, or delivery companies. Um, I think this is like a really important thing to think about is that you know, we live in an era now where, um, you know, we need to know, you need to know in advance what the regulatory scheme looks like and be able to figure out exactly how you want to engage on that. I, I mentioned, I kind of touched on this in, in the earlier portion, but the, um, you know, I, I think as since Uber and Lyft, Airbnb, now we've had, you know, e-scooters, e all of that. There's been, I think like public sentiment is really soured on the idea that you can simply just roll out an emerging technology or an emerging way of doing business and that people are going to be okay with it. And so I really, you know, I think it's, it's important to think about ways in which you can try and change the regulatory scheme on the front end, inform people of what it is and partner with cities, because then you'll, you'll, you'll be seen as forthcoming. You'll be able to actually show what your use case is. Um, and be able to, I think, uh, you know, come up, th they can come up with some thoughtful regulations if the regulators know what you are doing. And ultimately for platforms that, you know, existed without that sort of uh, approach for a long time, we've seen regulations that aren't necessarily responsive to how platforms work. Um, and so it, it can present some very serious challenges there. And um, yeah, just a I would think there's a lot of variation uh, between cities uh, in that regard, in terms of uh, having the capabilities to really um, allow innovation and, and, and encourage it um, versus those that just do not have really that ability or even that outlook uh, to do so. I mean, there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to probably do things in San Francisco uh, that has to do with micromobility than it is to uh, start it in Manhattan, say, say. I assume. Honey, considering where we are in the program, I wanted to ask you if you had a wrap up question you wanted to ask. Actually, no, I don't. If you have any more questions, we can ask that. Otherwise, we probably will ask if our uh, panelists who have been very patient uh, with us uh, today, if they have any final thoughts that they would like to share. Well, let me ask one because it's uh, relevant to the university, um, which is, uh, the question is for the panelists, how do your companies feel about sharing data with agencies and consultants? And to that, I'll ask universities uh, in terms of helping to conduct research on e-commerce and last mile delivery. Or how, I'm going to ask you, how do you work with those particular entities, or do you? Um, 
Uh, I can go on this. I, I think uh, it depends. Um, you know, I, we, we like to share data. Um, we think it can be really productive because it can inform what policymaking and regula regulations at, look like in this space. So sharing data with universities, um, with academics, with, uh, with um, lawmakers, it can all be really, really important for us. Um, and we can also glean insights from what they're able to find out. So I think, um, you know, partnering with, uh, with universities, Airbnb does this really, really well. They have a, they have a team of folks who um, will partner with economists and basically say, hey, you all should be able to do whatever research you want to do. We're going to open up our books. We're not requesting anything. We're not going to co-author it. We're not going to do any of that. So the, there's still academic integrity involved um, and, or they're able to preserve academic integrity and, they, um, and they're able to put out some really interesting research in this space. Some of it's favorable, some of it's not. And, um, but I think that creates a really robust dialogue that can be very helpful. For us, I think our major concerns are that as a privately held company, um, we can't share out data where, there's a sun sh where the data might be sunshineable. For example, so because it could become public by virtue of the fact that the local jurisdiction, someone could just file a public records request and then find out something that's proprietary for us, a competitor, for example, and then be able to reverse engineer something that we're working on. That could, that, that would be something we'd be legitimately concerned about. Um, I think another piece of this as well is, um, you know, making sure that the data is aggregated, preserving, um, you know, consumer privacy as well. California passed uh, CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, currently, that's sort of the benchmark in, in, in the United States. So, um, you know, so long as we're able to make sure that we're not crossing any lines there, um, you know, we're, we're really happy to do so. Thank you, Mike. You want to take that one? Sure. I mean, Farmers Church is a smaller company, so we like, like working with different universities and people that can help us along the way. And, you know, we're emerging on some logistics stuff, but they're also working with people on nutrition, like nutrition outcomes. If, like, here's what Americans normally eat for lunch. If you have like a salad or a nutritional bowl once a week, here's what your health outcome is over a week or a month. So we've done some interesting things with some universities on like nutritional outcomes of you just eating a couple more meals a week that are better for you. So, you know, again, as a small company, we'll take any help we can get at this point. Thank you, Susan. Uh, final word for you. In this respect, we do partner with many universities. Um, obviously, the University of Memphis is here in town, so we do a lot of work with them. Uh, we are protective of our data uh, for many of the reasons that Vignesh just mentioned. Um, so I don't think we're that transparent with our data, but we do like to partner. And, and depending on if it's the technology, et cetera, depends on how um, agreeable we are to it. So. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, again, thank you for your time and for staying this late uh, with us. Uh, it's been extremely informative uh, all, all around. Um, this does bring us to the conclusion of this uh, round table. Um, for, I want to also thank our audience uh, for staying with us. Um, next week, uh, same time, uh, we have our fourth um, roundtable in the series. Uh, we will be addressing shared mobility and micromobility and their role in reopening our cities. So please uh, do join us uh, next week as well. Um, and with that, again, uh, thank you all uh, for, for, for your time and uh, for this uh, very interesting session. Thank you for hosting, Hani. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Hani. Thank Thanks, you. Brett. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye. Take care. Thank you.